So um, I got started back in March last year, and I started with a little wind lathe off of Amazon. And so I've upgraded since then, though. I got a jet. It's a mini, so this thing is like a monstrosity to me. But anyways, I'm just going to go over a few of the materials I use. I got a ring chuck, which is on the lathe right now. It's from uh, Craft Supply USA, and it has three separate sets of bushings. These are the largest. I have the medium on, and then they have the little bitty ones, which that's what I need for my stuff. And then with my rings, I typically do wood, but you can do resins, um, just whatever material, really. I even got some mammoth uh, tooth recently, so that's terrifying and exciting at the same time. And just to go through some of my ring cores, and that's my son. <laughs> Um, I started out with stainless steel because they are cheap. I typically get them at Craft Supply USA, but they're really thick. They're almost the final thickness that you want. And so I upgraded to titanium, and they're much thinner. They're very lightweight. Most of these are brushed, but I go ahead and sand them down with 80 to 100 grit just to give something to hold on to when you glue it. I also discovered black ceramic, and they have white ceramic. I get these off of... I believe it's um, Opal Dealer on Etsy. And these are awesome because they don't scratch, like, at all. These will still scratch whenever I'm trying to smooth out the outer edge of it. These do not. So this is definitely my preferred one. They're a little bit more pricey. But 90% of rings I see are like this one. They have a channel cut in them. And some are two-piece where you actually have to put them together. You'll get a wooden blank or resin or whatever. And you have to get it to the perfect size, and then you can fit it in, you turn it down, and uh, it's a pretty simple ring. But this is just a solid channel. It's for inlays. So not really my thing, but there's some really cool ones that they've done like that. And just to go through some of the steps, because, of course, I've forgotten things, because that happens. Um, after selecting my blank, I get this, wherever I put it. It's somewhere. I don't know where it is, but I have. Ah. I usually get a drill bit that's just smaller than the inside diameter. Sometimes it's a little bit more, but this is what I had handy. And um, I'll go ahead and drill out the center of my blank. And once I get it pretty close, depending on the wood, sometimes I'll add CA to strengthen it. And then I of course didn't bring my tool but I'll use uh, I'll hollow it out and this is the iffy part because if you go too far it really screws it up and then you go through like four or five blanks before you get it the right size so you really have to be careful when you're hollowing out to get the right size on these and once it's and especially with ceramic here you want it to be snug but not too tight because if it's too tight as the wood moves it can possibly break especially people that wear it out in the heat a lot and so you really want it nice and snug. Set it with glue. Oh, you scratch these too with, like I said, sanding, sandpaper. And then that's where I get to this point. And um, if you do a good job, you shouldn't see a gap on either side. With me, because I'm just perfectionist, I guess, I'll tear it off and start over unless it's something really expensive. And then I've seen where you can get the shavings and fill in any gap. And it's a good enough match that it can pass. Most people don't notice it. I do. But that's me. And um, once I get it to this point, there's a really neat app that I found on my phone. And it's called Color Grab. And so, you know, some of us, it, I'm not the best at saying, oh, this color would look awesome with this color. I'm just not that kind of girl. I wish I was. And so this Color Grab app, you can actually match the color on your phone. It'll actually spell out what color it is with all the numbers and letters and everything. And it'll show complementary colors that would go good. That help you figure out what would actually look good and what you want to avoid. Because some colors clash horribly. But if you're doing customer orders, customers always right. So you just kind of kind of cringe on those. You try to direct them a little bit, but it doesn't always work. But what I'm going to start doing, after I get it to this point... I'll get it down to about double the size I want it to be finished, which is where this one is right now. And this is where I'll start doing my inlays. And, uh, well, I'm skipping over. I have 
a digital caliper and planning ahead if you want wire and stone or just wire or just stone you determine how much wood you want shown how much stone you want shown your wires you have quite a few options on the sizes typically for men's I use 20 gauge and this is dead soft wire it's pure copper if you don't get it pure a lot of times it's coated and whenever you get to turn in whatever's on the inside that's what's going to show and so I kind of learned that one the hard way too but sterling silver pure I like the 22 to 26 for women's rings because this is so thick on these little bitty thin rings you're not going to have any room to do a lot of detail work but with these thinner wires you can have wire on either side which is typically what I do like on this ring this ring is nearly done and this is my typical style yes and I can pass several of these around oh. There's that. Um, I use anything from 22 to 26. Here's one that's nearly completed as well. It has its first couple coats of CA. It's really rough, but I was in the process of sanding it, and I thought that'd be a good example to show kind of the almost final step. And um, whenever I get to this point where I'm going to go ahead and put the inlay, I usually take the inner all the way down to the ring core. And I have a little bit of wood left on this side. This was on, on my old win, and it wasn't perfectly dead center. And so one side would always have a little bit of extra wood. So then just take my tool, and I'll go ahead and take it out right quick. Yes, yeah, so all the way down to the core. Because with some of the inlays, you're going to be able to, it'll affect your final color. So say I used white opal and I left the wood. Well, white opal is semi-transparent, and so you're going to see some of whatever's underneath. And uh, another thing I'll do, depending on the look I want, because um, I recently did, I believe it's actually a pin, but I did a black ground with black fingernail polish. And fingernail polish is awesome because it comes in so many colors. And I'll go ahead and seal this with CA glue and uh, let it set up. Otherwise, I found fingernail polish will bleed into certain woods. And then when you're turning it down, you have these wonderful colorful spots in your wood that shouldn't be there. And then that says, start over. And so, like I said, I would fill this with CA. Once it's dry, I put whatever fingernail polish if I want to do that. And... Uh, depending on the style you're looking to too, sometimes you can see down to your core. And not everyone wants to see silver through their stone or black or whatever other color. So like I said, a lot of it depends on the, the look you're going for. Now, I'm going to go ahead and start putting some stone in this ring. And of course, I didn't think about what color I wanted until I got here. So hopefully it looks good. Yes, this is malachite stone. I got it from Craft Supply USA. I have, they call it jet black, magnesite, lapis. It's real, and they changed a lot whenever they get wet with CA. So whatever color you see isn't necessarily what your end color is going to be. If you get a little bit of water on some stones, then you can kind of see before you put them in. Um, red coral. This is really a brilliant red. Um, I probably say this wrong. I apologize. Christ. Chryscola? I'm not really a stone person, I'm not sure, but this is more of a blue-green stone. This is a big favorite, turquoise. I haven't met many people that don't like turquoise. And then one of my favorites, I just brought one of my colors, but this is opal. And opals are just gorgeous because they change color with all the different lights. And there's a ton of variety in opals. I think there's like 78 colors if you get uh, lab-made opals. This is another one with blue-green opal in it. And under sunlight, these are really spectacular. Oh, and I forgot to bring it. Coffee grounds. They actually are really, really neat in rings because you have dark caramels, some light colors, all in a ring. And they're really neat in sunlight. But um, let's go ahead and get this stone laid. And I would highly recommend gloves because it is not fun 
whenever you get your fingers glued to the stones or anything else. And I've done that more times, so I, I learned my lesson. <laughs> There's fine chips. I, I do have magnesite and a powder, but I don't like it as much because at least in the chips, you can kind of see variations more. It gives it, instead of looking at powder, you're looking at stone. And people tend to lean towards that some because the ones with just powder, they haven't done very well. But I think I just threw a bunch out. And I just use junky tweezers that aren't good for anything else. And I prefer to pour them in a different container because sometimes it's kind of a pain to pour them out of the bag. They come out quicker than you want and then they go everywhere and you're just wasting your money. And I typically lay a, I have a wax paper, but something underneath it because I'm cheap and I don't want to just throw all my stuff away. So if it falls on here, I can reuse it. And especially with opals because those are expensive. They're anywhere from 10 to $15 for this little bitty vial. And I do not want to have to buy a bunch of those just for one or two rings. But I'll go ahead and drop. This is Thin CA. I'm not a big fan of hot stuff. As soon as this is out, I'm switching. But I paid for it, so I'm going to use it. Um, I've heard Mercury Flex is good. But for this stage, I usually use Thin. And if it's not stopped up, I just do a thin drop to get it started. Use the other end of my tweezers and just start gradually dumping it in until it's almost level with the walls of the ring. It will, I will take it down lower than what it is right now, but if you don't want that silver showing through or whatever your base color is showing through, you're gonna wanna build it up. And this is just, it's pretty basic. I just build up a little wall and then it's like a little dam and you just fill in as you go around. And you can see, hopefully, how much it changes color from what it looks like in the back to what it looks like once it's in. It's really, it's really a nice color. And this is leopard wood on this one. Um... Oh, thank, I'm glad you brought that up because I totally skipped a couple of steps. Um, I will print in that this has a ring blank in it. Uh, once it has the actual, or the ring core, I'll take it to my belt sander and I'll get it flush on both of the sides, but I do not curve it yet. But I do want it completely flush, otherwise, at least with my setup, these bushings will hold the stone, or the stone, the wood instead of the actual core, and they should not touch wood, they should only touch core. And then I'll, I just use my, I use a carbide tool. So I'll use my square carbide tool to get it to, like I said, double the size of my final ring size thickness. And then um, I have my diamond tool where after I take a measurement of however wide I want it and I match it on both sides, which it varies so many different styles. I mean, you can offset it, you can have it in thirds, but usually on men's rings, I have about... 2.2 millimeters on either side for wood. So you can see some wood in there, but still see a fair amount of stone. And then I'll go ahead and use my uh, detailing tool and I'll cut out the center. And then I'll use a parting tool to remove it all the way to the, to the core. And um, then like I said, just start filling it with stone. And after it's filled with stone, or that's where this one is up to. And y'all can pass this one around. This has a Desert ironwood with a black ceramic core and blue opals. But that would be the next step. Oh, and this isn't fun because it does stink. That's actually going to be mine. <laughs> but I'll go around the whole ring and fill it. Some rings, they want different colors. I did one recently that had three different opal colors. And it gets a little tedious to measure the whole circle of the ring. And then figure out, put little lines and have equal number pieces all the way around. And uh, that just takes time because I'm not, I used to be good at math, but then uh, I became a stay-at-home mom and if you don't use it, you lose it. So uh, 
yeah, it, it just took a lot of trial and error to get the spacing correct. But um, so I'll lay it all the way around. I'll put a few more drops of CA to make sure that it's really held well. And um, then I usually leave it because I have accelerator and with this wonderful stuff, anytime I've used the accelerator, it turns it white. And so that's not a good look if you have this and any gaps are white. But after this step, I will turn it down and get it smooth to how this one is. However, I almost always have holes. And so at that point, this is my husband. He's about to find out how much fun this is because he's making that ring. I'll get the tweezers. I'll find stones that kind of are about the same size and shape as the hole. Sometimes it takes quite a few. And I'll place them. And then I just crush them down really hard. That is not tight. But I'll crush them down really hard. And then I'll put it just a teeny, teeny drop of CA glue to hold it in. And then I'll just repeat that all the way around the ring until there are no more holes in it. And then I take my round my round tool, and it's a negative rake, so it doesn't take as much off, and it doesn't chip it so bad, because I found if it's not negative rake, it'll chip the heck out of it, and then I'm just refilling and refilling and refilling. And so I'll get it smooth to this point. And this is where it gets a little bit more tedious, is putting in the wire. I put in the wire on one side already, just because I stuck my fingers to it about six times, and then I got tired of it, so it's like, I'll use the other half to show y'all, because I don't want to deal with it right now. And um, what I do before I lay the wire is I'll start measuring again, because it never fails. I'm going to be a tiny bit off on one side or the other. And so once I see where I'm going to go ahead and cut the line, sometimes I have to cut more in stone, sometimes I cut more into wood so that they are absolutely equal. And you think one or two millimeters won't make a difference it does it is very noticeable when you're done and then you have to redo it and that's not fun especially whenever you get so far along to start all the way over yeah well like so I use my uh, my round tool and I go ahead and turn it down and whenever I turn it down before the wire I get it down to its final size which is pretty thin and um, well, that, the completed ring that I passed around, that's about the final thickness. This one is about the same. But whenever I get to this point, I do not round the sides yet because then you can't get a very accurate read because it'll be sloped. But if it's straight, you can get a much more accurate read and make sure that they're equal. And whenever I lay this wire in, one of the reasons or whenever I'm laying it, it's one of those things like whenever you're fitting the ring core, you want to do tiny bits at a time because if you open this up too wide and set it too deep, then it just, it doesn't look as nice, at least in my opinion. And so I want the wire to fit until it's about halfway deep, if that makes sense. I want this open. But I use round, there's square out there, there's half round. But with this round, if it's exactly halfway, when you get it filed all the way down till it's flush, it's going to be at its widest and its most attractive. And so, if y'all don't want to see me lay stones all the way around because that takes some time, I'll go ahead and move on to doing a wire. Yes? Yes, uh, to meet up the ends, and I'm going to show that process shortly. And I think it's out of camera range, but I have this wonderful little bitty um, clamp or vise. And it was all of $5 on Amazon, and it is very painfully cheap. And I don't use it unless it's something like this, because it just doesn't work great. But um, let me get this off, and I'll explain that process. And this ring is mass, not this one. I just had it. Ah, this one is a size 6, 15 ring. And so I have to use my biggest bushings. And even they are almost not big enough. So unless you want to make your own bushings, 15 is about the biggest you go with this specific setup. I did have an order for a size 16 ring. And if the guy actually ever comes through, I'm going to have to make my own bushings for it. Because I don't have anything that big.